And then for, we meant for the PhD candidates exam, we're out with an aggressive list of tasks where we'll do automatic building detection for LiDAR data, then the automatic building detection for area imagery. We'll somehow automatically register them together, improve classification, and finally 3D reconstruction. I didn't quite get to the 3D reconstruction, but the accomplishments of the aforementioned four items wound up amounting to an impressive list of contributions, which will be extensively discussed in the research. Um, and then uh, the applications for building detection from, uh, are quite a few. Uh, first, it's really actually kind of difficult to reconstruct multiple buildings at a time. Usually you want to uh, automatically identify the buildings and then reconstruct them one at a time. I found this to be actually challenging for my uh, uh, master's thesis. You can do a reconstruction or you can do building identification. I started out to, hey, I'll manually extract the building and then do the reconstruction. But then later I realized it'd be nice if there was an automatic way to do this, so I pursued this with dissertation. Um, and the applications for either reconstruction or building detection are, of course, for the military automatic target recognition. Um, and you can develop tourist information systems, like if you're walking through a park, why well, look at a map and you have a kiosk to do your 3D walkthrough of the park. Or um, cell phone power placement. Uh, you can sample a given scene before a natural disaster and then after a natural disaster and to apply change detection analysis to determine the ability affected by the natural disaster. And then finally, the uh, urban planning. Um, so, what, how do we ideally want a building detection algorithm to work? Uh, first, we want to do better that avoid the beam. And then, unfortunately, sometimes the more it's automated, this again becomes really expensive detection rate. And then, uh, Meyer actually, uh, in his uh, sort of building detection review paper, brings up an interesting point: is we should incorporate the data that's available. Don't simply start out saying, "I require everything in order to do something." It would be better to simply say, "Hey, if this is available, I can do this." If this is available, I can do that. If both of them are available, I can do something better. Rather than say, I demand everything, or I demand just this and that. Incorporate the data that is available. And finally, you will wind up actually generalizing the uh, uh, use of the algorithm, or making it more applicable to other applications, if you can go beyond simple building, not building classification. If you can identify the vegetation, the ground, and so on and so forth, this becomes makes the algorithm better. Now, these are the ideal features. We've uh, have done a lot of work to strive towards accomplishing some of those features. One of which is for the automatic building detection for LiDAR data, we'll wind up assuming that, uh, could you at least please provide a minimum of one point for 1.5 meter squared point density. Um, and then we'll be able, from the LiDAR data approach alone, we'll be able to classify entities as building, non-building, and ground. If you, um, if, you have the build, if you have the aerial image, please at least have a minimum of 15 centimeter pixel resolution, and then we'll be able to classify things as buildings, vegetation, and non-building. If both are available, we'll automatically register them together and realize an improved classification with a slightly higher building detection rate. And uh, now the class is wind up being building and a non-building mostly being trees. The ground is dirt and pavement, but not grass. And then a separate uh, class for vegetation consisting of class of uh, grass and weeds. And uh, all the eight mentioned approaches are automatic. There's, we're not changing parameters as we apply to different data sets. And there's no uh, training phase either. They're uh, unsupervised conditions. <coughs> For the aerial imagery, any constraints on the spectral resolution of the equipment? Now, we're to, with a color photo, right? Not with a multi, we really uh, deal with multispectral um, aerial imagery. And I didn't actually take into account the spectral um, uh, the resolution, the spectral resolution. I'd have to, what do you mean exactly when you say, like, how many colors? Do you need to have at least three colors? Oh, and yes. Can you do grayscale imagery? Do you need 10 spectral bands for me? Um, you didn't specifically say what the limitations were for the we spectral nature as opposed to spatial nature. That's true. Yeah. I wound up using exploit color. So it would, uh, I didn't test the algorithm if it was um, uh, grayscale. I noticed some problems in converting the image to grayscale and using that. And that's why we wound up exploiting the color information. Uh, in particular, to be exactly what I'm talking about, is like you'll have a building region next to grass, and if I convert it into grayscale, we lost the color information, and then doing color segmentation while well, blending those together. So I guess in a sense, yes, it would be to have color error image to improve performance. Okay. With the spatial information, the spatial information is consistent with the color. Oh, I would assume the resolution would be consistent with right the resolution. Yeah, I didn't think that they, they could vary, actually, between the right the green and the blue. That's a good point. Um, 
So let's briefly survey the existing methodologies that are that, uh, aim to accomplish automatic building detection from a single nadir aerial image. The image that we're working with is a single nadir aerial image. I didn't uh, consider stereo pairs. That's, I forgot, I didn't mention that as well. Um, Cervicac et al. winds up identifying regions that are adjacent to, uh, or rather, he winds up identifying regions adjacent to shadows. So he detects the shadows, he identifies regions adjacent to the shadow, and then what he winds up doing is using this novel box fitting uh, algorithm, where he runs a canny edge detector, and then he minimizes an energy function by growing the box algorithm to meet the edges identified by the canny edge detector. The problem with this is what happens when the uh, building's uh, rooftop isn't homogeneous. Maybe it has multiple textures or multiple colors. His expanding box will stop prematurely. So if part of the roof is a different color or a different texture, which is typically like sun side, dark side roofs, then this is going to uh, wind up having a problem. Um, Lefebvre wound up in implementing an interesting approach where he uh, winds up implementing a bi dimensional gradient machine where he uh, traverses a window across the given image and applies morphological filtering operations. And, and he even recon claims reconstructing the um, uh, the, the buildings within there, and it's a bi-dimensional granular tree in the sense that the length and the width of the window vary. Uh, this is nice because the moment you start a suit traversing with a static window, you'll wind up problems in that there is no perfect static window size uh, with morphological filtering approaches by doing identifying buildings and developing digital terrain and digital surface models. If the window is too large, you could remove a hill, but not preserve a building, and the maximum window size is a problem, where this is an interesting approach. The thing is, is all of his reconstructed buildings are parallel. The rectangular boxes, they're parallel with each other, and then those are parallel with the size of the images because it's a bi-dimensional granular tree. He didn't vary the orientation of the window as well. Which I, they, they leave out these details in the papers. Um, and then Cervicac et al., he winds up detecting red rooftops, and then he finds the shadows, and he uses that for the direction of the illumination. But uh, he assumes that the buildings, some of the buildings have red rooftops. Um, that, that quickly learned that, that, that a, don't assume specific colors for the tops of buildings. They can even have green rooftops, as awesome as that is. Um, Mallor and Zahn wind up using a linear regression classifier on a, um, a set of rectangular regions. Uh, various geometric and photometric uh, features are calculated for these regions, and then a linear regression classifier winds up identifying them as building or non building. Um, it, quickly reviewing these approaches and several other in the uh, literature, um, first, it's when you implement these limiting types of assumptions, the more restrictive your assumptions are, the, the fewer and fewer buildings your uh, approach is applicable to. And, and something that's infinitely frustrating is, is you'll come up with a title, Automatic Building Detection from, uh, for Buildings, but then you present only a couple hundred buildings for your results, and, and when you look at it further examination, you had trouble with all of the smaller buildings. And they sometimes don't preserve and present these results in that uh, scenario. They don't give completeness and correctness, which I'll go over in a minute, as a function of the building size. They instead of only report global parameters. And only for a couple hundred buildings, maybe only on a single data set. Whereas different data sets have different characteristics, and there are a uh, great deal of different uh, types of uh, buildings. Um, some of the other approaches, well, instead of being unsupervised or automatic, they're semi-supervised. And one of the uh, disadvantages of semi-supervised approaches is sometimes they'll wind up making assumptions that are particular to the data set. Like, we'll manually extract a fourth all the way up to a half of the data set, we'll identify features in this data set, and then do um, the building detection. The thing is, is sometimes the, they say, okay, we use the shadows, and all the shadows on the northeast side, and you go to a different building set, and then the shadows are on another side. So, I mean, unless it's otherwise for a proposal, one of the things you need to get around this is by using data set invariant features. And I've only seen a few papers that actually propose using that. Otherwise, you have to be careful when you review papers with that. That's really important. Um, another aspect is, uh, again, like I said, some of them don't report the correctness. So like if I have 10 pixels in five of the building, and I say all the pixels are building, my accuracy is 100%. If I don't tell you the correctness, my accuracy, my correctness will only be 50%, because I'm calling five pixels non-building that are in the building that are non-building. So it's imperative that you report that. To not report either on a pixel or <coughs> building level is kind of misleading. Uh, I'd also like to go over some methods that use building detection from both LiDAR and or uh, aerial imagery. And uh, Rubinstein winds up proposing the use of this Dempster shape of fusion. He develops a probability mass function to be able to detect certain classes with only a single feature set is what he looks at. So like the normalized difference vegetation index or the difference between digital terrain models and digital surface models. Um, and then what you wind up doing is using Dempster uh, Schaefer theory to combine the several probability mass functions from the different feature sets to realize a uh, classification based on all of the feature sets. 
um, the data can winds up manually extracting features from the, uh, the, uh, the data set. And he'll develop fuzzy membership functions based on the distribution of those features and how those features correlate to building the algorithm. And then use that for classification. And then finally, Bossman will go through and do a spanning tree and then use the spanning tree on different profiles of LIDAR data to be able to differentiate between building and non building, or to differ differentiate between uh, uh, ground and non ground, and then additional features to differentiate between building and non building. Some of the um, limitations or drawbacks of these approaches and several others is first is they wind up, they say their approach is automatic, but then as a pre processing technique, we wind up manually registering the data sets together in LIDAR and aerial imagery. And furthermore, a great deal of them require the LiDAR data to be interpolated. Uh, Vossman argues that the interpolation of the LiDAR data produces additional inaccuracies. Uh, it's kind of under debate. I, I've yet to read a good paper where they, uh, they show what the interpolation does and how it degrades the algorithm. And I think the reason why is what the features you're using are dependent on your end result. So if your features, for whatever you wound up using, are affected by the interpolation, then maybe your algorithm is a little bit more robust than the interpolation. But Vossman argues there are inaccuracies, and then there's an additional computational overhead. Uh, and furthermore, like some of the approaches using morphological filtering are going to require you to set a size for the window, which may or not may, may or may not be optimal for the data set anyways. And then um, Rottensteiner winds up, and, and another approach winds up also have implementing some parameters that require manual inspection of the terrain, and they're dependent on those manual parameters to reproduce the results in the paper. And then finally, uh, some of these building approaches, uh, one of which I recently reviewed by Ulrich, was uh, only applicable to uh, res uh, larger buildings and not residential. Maybe on your point number two about the data being interpolated, did you try taking, I, I know in your thesis you worked on the point cloud data, right? So non-interpolated. Did you try converting that to a, a raster grid of interpolated points and then putting that through the uh, same process? That's, that's a good point. That's something I didn't try it out. I did. Uh, I interpolate the elevation for a different reason, for visual purposes. Not going over that. Right. I understand that. Sure. Okay. Oh, but not for extraction. Yeah. Um, all right. So we wound up contributing a method, and I wound up talking about this at uh, a Harris Technical Seminar. It is for building detection for lighter data using the proposed use of pseudo homotopy trees. But we also have this under review in a remote sensing journal as well. It was presented at a conference in uh, Malta. Um, so, so what is a homotopy tree? The, imagine the set Y contains all of the dark gray space, and the set Y complement contains all of the space in which Y is not occupied. And then consider Y not to be all of the white background, and Y not the white unbounded connected set background is bounded to Y as adjacent to Y 1, 1 and Y 1, 2. The first uh, index is the generation, and the second index is the node's location and generation. I'll get to that in a moment. Why 1, 1 is adjacent to 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3. And this is the concept of homotopy trees for using set theory or topography for describing a given surface. And you can see why not is adjacent to 1, 1, and then why 1, 1 is adjacent to those three surfaces, where the arrows in the tree denote you know, adjacency. And then the, this is the, first, the zero generation, the first, the second, and third. Um, we modify this formal mathematical definition in that in a pseudo homotopy tree for our application, the root node doesn't necessarily encompass or surround all the future growth, uh, uh, nodes, and it isn't an unbounded uh, set. In this case, we wound up having a root node being a bounded set. But we still use, we still found that the use of this pseudo homotopy tree could be very uh, applicable towards automatic building detection and identifying multiple ground points. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, I have to go over some brief definitions. The first I want to do is a triangle orientation. Um, imagine that the uh, z-axis is the elevation axis pointing 